It's been almost 20 years since one of the most infamous crime bosses of all time, Joseph Bonanno, who died a week ago at the age of 97, agreed to sit down with us and for the first and only time in front of a television camera, talked about himself and the other real-life godfathers who inhabited his world. With his two sons and his daughter at his side, we met at his home in Tucson, Arizona, a couple of thousand miles and a world away from the streets of New York, where back in 1927, Joe Bonanno first came into contact with the mafia kingpin of his day, Salvatore Maranzano. Your first hero. That's right. Was Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano. Yes. But then you say he was said to be able to snap a man's neck with his fingers. And I say when I read that. That's a metaphorical. Well, uh, it's, it's quite a metaphor. Well, <laughs> it's quite a metaphor. He also told you this. Man is the hardest animal to kill. When you aim at a man, your hands shake, your eyes twitch, your heart flutters. But you kill nonetheless. That's what I find a little difficult to understand. You gotta make sure fighting for your life and to protect your life and nobody has the right to destroy another human being. All you don't do, but once you do, make sure. And make sure that you protect yourself with anything. So that I can fully understand what your dad's saying. Sometimes there comes point in, in the affairs of men where you try to control by force. And if that does not succeed, then you have to control by being a brute. By? Being a brute. And if possible, Maranzano told you, if possible, always touch the body with your gun to make sure the man is dead. Once you fight to survive and to protect your life, make sure that you succeed. But Maranzano himself became a victim of the mob. He was stabbed six times and shot four times by killers in the hire of Lucky Luciano. And it was after Maranzano's death that the so-called commission was created, effectively the judicial and executive body of the mob. The first commission was composed of Lucky Luciano, Vincent Mangano, Gaetano Gagliano, Joe Profacci, and Joe Bonanno. According to law enforcement officials, the commission rules on problems pertaining to disputes among the fathers and is also believed to order contract hits, killings of members who get out of line. Bonanno was one of the ruling commission members for over 30 years. The commission, they sit around, they say, okay, that man's gonna go. We're not gonna do it. No, the commission will never say that. The commission has nothing to, uh, to, do, uh, uh, to do this. I'm wrong? No, nah, you're not question Who, wrong. Who orders a hit? Ah. Who orders a hit? Who orders a killing? The, the, it's a family, it's a family practice and uh, 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 free of their own. The commission has an authority okay. on a family. No. This is a profile of the Bonanno crime family that I got from the New York police. Okay? Bonanno went to his close friend, Joe Magliocco, and requested his help to kill three crime bosses, Gambino, Lucchese, and Magadino. They're bologna, fantas, and liars. Let me continue. Gambino called a meeting of the commission. Magliocco told all it was fined $40,000 and deposed from the commission. Joe Colombo was rewarded by being named the new Don and taking Magliocco's place on the commission. Bonanno, in the meantime, simply gave the commission the finger told them to get lost, in other words. The commission became angered and sent word to Bonanno that he was dismissed from the commission. Is this, all that garbage? It's all garbage, a liar, filthy, and untruth and false. It built up. This, I can say this, uh, even if I get a give, if I, I gotta die any moment. This uh, never happened, this uh, never was the truth, and uh, this is all garbage. They take it from Zabonano. At the age of only 26, Bonanno became the youngest father in history of a crime family. At that time, he was still driving a truck part-time. 
After becoming boss, he married Faye, mother of his three children. It was as head of the Bonanno crime family that Joe Bonanno rubbed elbows with some of the leading mafia figures of our time. And he knew probably the most famous and powerful crime figure in America at the time, Scarface Al Capone. You knew Al Capone? Oh, I happened to know him, you know. What kind of a man? Al Capone was a very jolly guy. Al Capone was a jolly guy? Jolly guy. <laughs> what do you find so funny, Bill? Uh, my reaction is to your reaction. It's surprise. Well, I like him. Why did you like him? For his uh, character, for his approach, for his, uh, uh, the way he handled himself, uh, the way, uh, the external appearance. But I never knew a Capone from inside. Charles Lucky. Lucky Luciano. What was his power? What was his talent? What kind of a man? Luciano believed in money. Luciano said, look, uh, he believed in syndicate. That's why Luciano, he, 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 he believed uh, believe to make money. Uh, what's wrong with his wanting money? I mean, you're, B Bonanno wanted money. But I don't want his money or his kind of money. Bonanno claims that he made money in the more traditional ways, gambling and bootlegging, while Luciano went for the big payday, making his money through narcotics, prostitution, extortion. Here you have two young fellows coming up in, their, in, in the world, in their own world, seemingly from the same background. Bonanno and Luciano. And Luciano, and instantly having a conflict of philosophy, a philosophical conflict. And what basically was the, the conflict in philosophy? The, uh, Luciano was an American product. An American and product. And a Sicilian product. Right, that is the conflict, and the conflict boiled down to the Americans wanted everything to revolve around money, making money. And your, your father what? His whole life has been one of trying to live up to his own principles and his own traditions, which have come in conflict with the new tradition of this country. One thing I can remember as a, as a child growing up, and my dad told me, there's three things that just aren't, that just don't happen. And? And one is women, living off of women, meaning prostitution, where a woman supports you right two is dealing in narcotics and the third is hurting anybody for money now let me understand that if anybody dealt in narcotics from the banana family or in prostitution from the banana family or killing on contract for money in the banana family they did it without your knowledge without my knowledge no question about you swear it Huh? You swear it. I swear it before God. Because but according to law enforcement officials, Joe Bonanno has links with known heroin traffickers. One of them was Carmine Galante, his longtime underboss, who was murdered in 1979 with his cigar still warm in his mouth. Carmine Galante worked for you. He was picked up and convicted of a narcotics charge. If Joe Bonanno runs a family, he's supposed to know what's going on. If Carmen Galante, without my knowledge, prior to dealing with narcotics, I never know this. I don't have to swear, but I can swear on anything. Mafia fathers ordinarily shun publicity, except for an occasion of great joy as with a son's wedding. And when Bill Bonanno married Rosalie Profaci, Joe Bonanno provided the most lavish mob wedding on record. Every forgive me, mobster in the world, it seemed, in the United States, was at that hotel in New York. Detroit was there, Cleveland was there, Buffalo was there, Los All Angeles the was, there. was there. All the United States was there. All the United States was there. Yeah, like... Uh, but, I mean, this uh, was... This like was a, a congressman was there, the judges was there. The <laughs> president uh, got the equal the communist thing. The bankers. Uh, 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 Bennett, Tony Bennett sang all night with an after Four lads were entertained. Uh, Some the, opera singer was the there. Opera singer was there. there. There were 3,000 people there. And I venture to say, according to FBI statistics, that there are not more than 4,000, quote, mafia members, unquote, in the whole United States, according to the FBI. <laughs> And every major mafia leader in the United States was at that wedding. 
along with the congressmen and the lawyers and the bankers. And no, any major mafia leader. All the, uh, mostly over the major father, over the family, of uh, this uh, beautiful symbol of uh, my traditional generation was there, the father, the head of the family. Out of respect for you. Out of respect for me, yes. If a family member had an affair with another family member's wife, what was the penalty? What is the penalty? Dead. Death. In the calling of uh, the court. Who does the killing? Ah, huh? the, the guy, the guy, not the family. The, 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 the guy, the cuckolder, let's say this. The cuckolded man does the killing. If he wants to kill him. <laughs> People have a funny idea. They think that this is a life of action. They think it's a life, a very romantic life. Not romantic in a romance sense. But, but actually, the particular lifestyle that many people have become involved in over the years is really just a lifetime of waiting, tremendous lulls between moments of action. And I've never understood, Bill Banana, why you didn't turn your back on him and say, come on, a man of intelligence, yourself, attractive, gift of command, articulate, educated, and a hoodlum. Why? You know how many times I've asked myself that question? It all comes down to one thing. It comes down to love of heritage and love of another person. That other person, of course, is his father. You have said the U.S. government has yeah. tried to destroy you. Yeah, that's right. Why have they failed to destroy you? They haven't failed yet. They haven't failed? No, well, yes. They may course. still get you? Yeah, well, sure. All my life I've been misunderstood. I just uh, rule my family as a father. To this day, among men of Bonanno's tradition, family loyalty is foremost, and everyone outside the family is considered a stranger. I make this toast to wish you all good health and Merry Christmas. You know why? Because I love you all. Oh, thank God you. God bless 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 you. A footnote. For all the tales of Joe Bonanno's misdeeds, his crimes, the fact is that he spent just 26 months behind bars, convicted only of obstruction of justice and contempt of court. Tonight, more about Joe Bonanno, for over 30 years head of one of New York's organized crime families. Five weeks ago on this broadcast, Joe Bonanno claimed that all his life he has been misunderstood. That he was not the kind of criminal that law enforcement officials have made him out to be. Tonight in part two, Bonanno insists once again that through all his years as boss of the Bonanno family, he did what he did the honorable way. Do you ever say to yourself, Joe? I have the brain, I have the heart, I have the strength. And you know I didn't go the respectable way. Uh, I went more than respectable way, I went to the honorable way. Because I came from Sicily and I came from the family Bonanno, who has a great tradition in Sicily, and I came here with Hanna. So Bonanno has now written a book about his life and times. He likes to think of himself as a benevolent patron like Don Corleone in the movie The Godfather. He says The Godfather was not even a mafia picture, but instead a picture that showed the Sicilian spirit. I look, Carl. I want you to, I want you to rest well in the month from now. This Hollywood big shot's going to give you what you want. Too late. They start shooting in a week. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. You like the picture? I like Marlon Brando in the turn of the feeling over the net of the family. You sound a little uh, like Marlon Brando. That is, I don't know, but I had a little a couple of hair more than him. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Bonanno liked that movie because they like to be portrayed that way, you know, like the kindly family head who takes care of everybody. But when in fact they're murderers, 
Joe Coffey is commanding officer of the New York Police Department's Organized Crime Homicide Unit. The Godfather in the film was a prototype of Joe Bonanno? Absolutely, without any question. Without any question. A criminal, well, that's better. A criminal, an arch criminal, a parasite. He agrees he's been involved in gambling, bootlegging. Narcotics and prostitution, he says. No, never. Can I say to you that Mr. Bonanno had a bag of heroin in his hand or a bag of cocaine? or actually smuggled narcotics into this country? No, I can't say that. But we know that his family, his crime family, the Bonanno crime family, which still holds that name today, is directly involved in the smuggling, importation, and distribution of narcotics in this country. Documented. Joe Bonanno says he long ago retired from all dealings with the crime family that still bears his name. He lives in Tucson, Arizona, where we talk to him, surrounded by his children. His oldest son, Bill. Joe Jr. and Catherine. Back in 1964, Bonanno's power was being challenged by his fellow mob bosses, notably by his cousin, Buffalo crime boss, Stefano Magadino. On October 21st that year, Bonanno was returning home from dinner when two gunmen grabbed him on Park Avenue in New York City and kidnapped him. The headlines of the day wrote Joe Bonanno off as dead. His attorney then was tough-talking William Power Maloney, who was with Bonanno when he was abducted. Does this entire matter appear mysterious to you at all, or funny? I think it appears mysterious to almost everybody in the world, doesn't it? When a man is snatched away in front of your eyes and you don't see him at all again, hear nothing about him, I think that's pretty mysterious. Who kidnapped you back in 1964? My dear cousin. They kidnapped him. Stefano Magadino. Yes. Not himself. No. Tell me, what was your reaction when they picked you up on Park Avenue? Well, my reaction, this is it. <laughs> According to Bonanno, Magadino wanted him out of the way so that he could take over the Bonanno family. But six weeks after kidnapping him, says Bonanno, Magadino released him. Why didn't Magadino kill you? Why not? For many, many reasons. Maybe either one, uh, my blood, and his conscience, maybe the retaliation from my people uh, from New York, they would go to, uh, to Buffalo because they weren't afraid, afraid of him. But Bonanno was afraid that one of the other bosses might try to kidnap him again or kill him, so he went into hiding. Nineteen months later, he walked into the Brooklyn Federal Court building. The authorities had believed that he was living in South America or Haiti or Europe. And to this day, they insist, Bonanno was not in the United States during those 19 months. This uh, fantasy, this incredible fantasy, that I was, uh, I was in South America, I was in Sicily, I was all over the world. And I was in New York, Long Island, upstate New York, Keskill. Well, I had a lot of good friends. Playing golf. Sometimes. Bill Bonanno, who was consigliere of the crime family, the third in charge, on a rainy Sunday took us back to the Ridgewood section of Brooklyn that was his crime family's turf. And he talked about his father's disappearance. All this nonsense about the FBI not knowing about his disappearance. We negotiated for months to bring my father in with the FBI. Hoover had sent a couple of his agents to talk to me about it. And? They kept wanting more and more. First it was that he was to surrender. Then they wanted to arrest him in a restaurant. Then they wanted to ha have him show up at the FBI headquarters. All for publicity purposes. Following the kidnapping, according to law enforcement authorities, the soldiers of the Bonanno family turned violent. They became one of the most violent families in America. The Bonanno family was not the most sophisticated family in organized crime. It still isn't. Uh, it's a sloppy family. Sloppy family, what do you mean? Sloppy in a way that they have no sophistication about them in the way they kill. From the time Joe Bonanno disappeared in 1964 until the time he says that he retired from crime in 1968, a mob war was fought in the streets of Brooklyn. The Bonanno family against armies of mobsters from the other four New York City families. The war, uh, in effect, was ridiculous from a law enforcement point of view. Bodies were dropping all over Brooklyn. Well, this is where the so-called Banana War took place, in which 20 of you were up against how many others? Pick a figure. 
No. 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. And you survived most of you? Most of us, yes. And how many did you get on the other side? Then we kept track. And Gaspar de Gregorio, who was your godfather, right. he, he baptized, baptized, you. He baptized you. Right. was operating I as a traitor, if you will, All right. for Stefano Magadino. Precisely. And trying to kill you. Precisely. Nice crowd. I mean, you smile about it, but the fact of the matter is that that's the way you lived back then. My great-grandfather told me, rather, my great-grandfather has said to my father, who has told me, one of his prayers was, Dear Lord, protect me from my friends because I can take care of my enemies. Yeah. And I always remember that. Need I say more? This is the way I burn if I expose this organization. It was Joe Valacci back then who caused Joe Bonanno more problems than his fellow bosses. For it was Valacci, the low-level mob informant, who told a Senate committee and a national television audience that the man who made him in the mob, the man who was his godfather, was none other than... Right. Joe Bonanno. Joe Bonanno? He happened to be my godfather. I never saw Joe Valacci in my life. He never saw my face. He was the filthy over the bottom of level of this supposed to be mafia. Are you telling me, however, that there is no such thing as organized crime? There is no mafia? Certainly there is no... not. I am not telling you that. Organized criminal activity, Mike, is as old as, Amer as, as American as apple pie. You go back to the James brothers, the Dalton gangs, the turn of the century Jewish gangs, the Irish gangs, the Italian element, Work and right. after the Italian element, it has run its course. The Italian ethnic criminals of this country are only one tile in a giant mosaic of organized criminal activity that this country has gone through. Now we have the blacks, we have the Puerto Ricans, we have the Cubans, we have the Colombians. I mean, it's an endless stream of activity that's, as I said, as American as apple pie. And it was bootlegging, which used to be as American as apple pie, that first filled the coffers of the Bonanno crime family in the 30s, gave them the capital to invest in other rackets. But Joe Bonanno says it wasn't just mobsters who got rich from bootlegging. Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger. A bootlegger? Yes, he was a smart. He made a lot of money. He was a partner of Frank Castello. Who, who was a partner of Frank Castello? Joe, Joe Kennedy. That allegation in Bonanno's book has been denied by a spokesman for the Kennedys, who says his late father-in-law, the head of the Kennedy family, who made a fortune in the liquor business, was not a bootlegger nor a partner of crime boss Frank Costello. During that same period in the 30s, Bonanno says, he was made an offer he refused. He says he turned down an offer by mobster Lucky Luciano to cut him in on a piece of New York's garment district. He says the offer was made by Luciano as a token of friendship. What does that mean, offer Joe Bonanno a piece of the Because he was controlling it. He was controlling it. Uh, controlling what? Uh, controlling it uh, uh, at that time, uh, the government kind of district. The unions? Uh, the union, whatever, the American But in 1968, Joe Bonanno says that he decided to retire from his life in crime, and he moved his year-round home to Tucson, Arizona, where the FBI began their most concerted effort to put him in prison. In 1975, an Arizona narcotic strike force team working with the FBI began to collect Joe Bonanno's garbage. A former FBI agent, Gene Amon, was with the strike force at the time of those garbage collections. Who came up with the idea of stealing his garbage? Well, first, uh, the, the idea of stealing, of course, is uh, repugnant to us because that wasn't the case, but... Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You'd, you, you were in a garbage truck, you'd stop in front of his house, you'd yes. take his garbage, yes. you'd put other garbage into the can, put it back down, and you, and you stole his garbage. That was public domain at that point, and has been determined to be that by courts. Okay. Did we take his trash? Yes. Uh, it was my idea. What did you learn about criminal activities as a result of this garbage inspection? Very little. Gene Amon in Arizona went, the, the so-called garbage policeman, right. went through my father's garbage among the olive oil cans and the spaghetti drippings on the paper and admittedly in court admitted that they had no reason 
to investigate the man, that they did this for four years, hoping to find something to pin on him. And they came up with one thing, that he spoke to members of his family about an investigation that was involving, that involved two of his sons. But with leads developed from that so-called garbage cover and evidence from an informant's testimony plus wiretaps on Bonanno's telephone, the Justice Department was able to convict Joe Bonanno of conspiracy to obstruct justice for tampering with a grand jury investigation involving Bonanno's sons Bill and Joe Jr. It was Bonanno's first felony conviction. And the man who was most instrumental in finally getting the evidence on him went back to Bonanno after he left the narcotic strike force with a business proposition. Mr. Amon, did you want to make a film of the Bonanno family? Did you make a proposal to Skip Donau, the attorney for the Bonanno family, that you make a documentary on the life of Joseph Bonanno Sr.? I talked to him about that, yes. Why would you want to do that? Because Mr. Bonanno's an interesting figure. I mean, you're the guy who ran the garbage cover. You were the man who went after him to try to find something on him. And now you want to make money off the, off the life of Joe Bonanno. I would suggest that my interest was not dissimilar to yours. Well, I'm not a cop. Neither am I. Anymore? Anymore. Is he a man? And I use this word carefully. Is he a man that you reluctantly respect? With an equally careful response, yes. People have a funny idea. They think that this is a life of action. They think it's a life, a very romantic life. Not romantic in a romance sense. But, but actually, the particular lifestyle that many people have become involved in over the years is really just a lifetime of waiting. Tremendous lulls between moments of action. And I've never understood, Bill Banana, why you didn't turn your back on him and say, come on, a man of intelligence yourself, attractive, gift of command, articulate, educated, and a hoodlum. Why? You know how many times I've asked myself that question? It all comes down to one thing. It comes down to love of heritage and love of another person. That other person, of course, is his father. Bill Bonanno and his younger brother Joe now face state and federal charges in California for conspiracy to commit mail fraud and for interstate transport of stolen property. Their trial is set for this summer. Joe Bonanno is scheduled to begin serving up to five years in prison sometime this spring. You realize, of course, that in 1983, it is possible that you and your son Bill and your son Joe That's right. all could be in prison. Oh, yes. The only thing in myself I have is still my trust in God, faith in myself. And when you have a faith in yourself and trust in God, you're going to have to war.